Inherited monarchies have an interesting problem that democracies and dictatorships do not have. When a king dies, especially a young one, the next king in line just might be a child. Nations get by somehow using advisors while their ruler goes up, but it does present some problems. There were several young kings in the history of Israel and Judah. Manasseh was 12 when he became king. Josiah was eight. But today I want to look at the youngest king of Judah, Joash, or Jehoash, who was seven when he was anointed king, although arguably he was the rightful king at only one year of age. The story of his ascension to the throne is both dramatic and tragic, and there are examples in his life and those around him that we can all learn from for good or for avoiding evil. Joash was not supposed to be the king. Of all the royal seed of his father, he was the youngest. In fact, his father was also the youngest. But God chose him specifically to carry forward the line of David as the sole survivor of a purge that God himself brought about. Although Joash was in the southern kingdom of Judah, we're going to begin our story in the northern kingdom of Israel. Ahab was the king, Jezebel the queen, and Elijah was prophet. Jezebel had already threatened to kill Elijah, who had now returned from Mount Horeb, when God gave him one of the few assignments that he was recorded as performing after his return. And we'll find that in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 21. 1 Kings 21. Elijah is told to meet Ahab outside of his Jezreel palace. Ahab had desired the land belonging to Naboth, but he couldn't convince Naboth to sell it. And Jezebel had arranged to have Naboth put to death. And Ahab is enjoying his new property when Elijah shows up. And in verse 20, 1 Kings 21, we read, So Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring calamity on you. I will take away your posterity. I will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both bond and free. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. These were previous dynasties in Israel that God had already destroyed. Because of the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger and made Israel sin. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dogs shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city, and the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. This was pretty gruesome stuff. In verse 25, it says, There was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord, because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. And he behaved very abominably in following idols, according to all that the Amorites had done, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. One major theme throughout our story, who are you following, and what influence are you having on others? Jezebel influenced Ahab to do wickedly, even though Ahab was responsible for his actions. And in verse 27, so it was when Ahab heard those words that he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, see how Ahab has humbled himself before me. Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity to his house. 
Meanwhile, in the southern kingdom of Judah, Jehoshaphat had ascended to the throne. Now, Jehoshaphat was one of the best kings Judah ever had. But he had a character trait that did not serve him or his people well. He considered the northern kingdom to be their brothers. He wanted peace with them and good relations. Perhaps he had a long-term goal of uniting the kingdom again. It all sounds very good. But supporting a man who was as wicked as Ahab for the purpose of achieving that peace was not wise. It's a principle we might want to keep in mind in today's politics and perhaps a good reason not to participate. But support by Je Jehoshaphat went way beyond just voting for the guy. In 1 Kings 22, next chapter over, we read this beginning in verse 1. Now three years passed without war between Syria and Israel. Then it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went down to visit the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, but we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria? So he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to fight at Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Jehoshaphat insists on inquiring about this battle from a prophet of God, but in spite of the dire warnings from Micaiah against Ahab, Jehoshaphat still agrees to join him in the battle, barely escaping with his life as Ahab is killed. You have to wonder how much he really believed what God said. I'd like to go over now to 2 Chronicles. The same story is related over there. Story of these kings. And we're going to take, spend a lot more time in 2 Chronicles than we do in Kings. 2 Chronicles 19. 2 Chronicles 19 and verse 1. Then Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely to his house in Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Therefore the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Nevertheless, good things are found in you, and that you have removed the wooden images from the land and prepared your heart to seek God. So did Jehoshaphat learn his lesson? Apparently not. In the next chapter, chapter 20, verse 35, we read that after this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, allied himself with Amaziah, king of Israel. This was Ahab's first son, who acted very wickedly. And he allied himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish. And they made the ships in Ezean Geber. But Eliezer, the son of Dodava of Marashah, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you have allied yourself with Ahaziah, the Lord has destroyed your works. Then the ships were wrecked so that they were not able to go to Tarshish. Ahaziah was Ahab's first son, as I said. He dies after only two years, and a second son, Jehoram, takes the throne. The country of Moab takes the opportunity this leadership change offers and rebels against the king to seek independence. We're going to go back briefly now to 2 Kings. You might keep your finger here because we're coming back to Chronicles. 2 Kings, verse chapter 3. 2 Kings chapter 3 and verse 6. So King Jehoram went out of Samaria, Samaria at that time and mustered all Israel. Then he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? And Jehoshaphat said, I will go up. I am as you are. My people as your people. My horses as your horses. The very same words he had used with Ahab. 
And again, Jehoshaphat insists that a prophet of God be consulted, and this time Elisha is brought before them. And in verse 13, Elisha says to the king of Israel, What have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. His father and mother, of course, being Ahab and Jezebel. But the king of Israel said to him, No, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. And Elisha goes ahead, inquires of God, and this time God chooses to give Jehoram and Jehoshaphat the victory. But fighting alongside these wicked kings of Israel was not the worst of it. Nor was it merely that he seemed to like them. He had another reason for his loyalty to them. And if we go back to 2 Chronicles 18, Slightly before where we were before. Second Chronicles 18, we will see this verse. Verse 1. Jehoshaphat had riches and honor and abundance, and by marriage he allied himself with Ahab. Other than the ongoing <clears throat> close relationships with the kings of the north, we are not told what the nature or consequence of this entangling marriage alliance is, until chapter 21. So we'll go over to chapter 21 now, and we'll begin in verse 1. Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. Then Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. He had brothers, the sons of Jehoshaphat, which are then named. All these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. Their father gave them great gifts of silver and gold and precious things with fortified cities in Judah, but he gave the kingdom to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. And in verse 4, when Jehoram was established over the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself and killed all his brothers with the sword and also others of the princes of Israel. And in verse 6, it says, he walked in the way of the kings of Israel just as the house of Ahab had done for he had the daughter of Ahab as a wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Yet the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David and since he had promised to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. So here we find out that <clears throat> what that marriage alliance was all about. Jehoshaphat had arranged for Ahab's daughter to marry his son, and it didn't go well. In verse 12, Jehoram receives a letter, a letter from, of all people, Elijah the prophet, who had disappeared years ago when Elisha took over. And that letter said, Thus says the Lord God of your father David, because you have not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat your father or in the ways of Asa king of Judah, but have walked in the way of the kings of Israel and have made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to play the harlot like the harlotry of the house of Ahab and also have killed your brothers, those of your father's household who were better than yourself. Behold, the Lord will strike your people with a serious affliction, your children, your wives, and all your possessions, and you will become very sick with the disease of your intestines until your intestines come out by reason of the sickness day by day. Another gruesome prophecy, probably made even worse by the fact that this was in a letter that he could refer to all the, any day he wanted to. Verse 16, Moreover, the Lord stirred up against Jehoram the spirit of the Philistines and the Arabians who were near the Ethiopians, and they came up into Judah and invaded it and carried away all the possessions that were found in the king's house and also his sons and his wives, so that there was not a son left to him except Jehoahaz, also known as Ahaziah, 
the youngest of his sons. He had killed all of his brothers. Now his own sons are taken away. In verse 20, he was 32 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem eight years and to no one's sorrow departed. However, they buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. That being put in the tombs of the kings was generally a sign of not being happy with him. In chapter 22 of Second Chronicles, beginning in verse 1, Then the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah his youngest son king in his place, for the raiders who came with the Arabians into the camp had killed all the older sons. So Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. Ahaziah was, it says, 42 years here. Uh, if you figure this out, you realize that his father died when he was age 40. He was definitely not 42. And when you look in 2 Kings 8 to 26, you discover that his correct age was 22. He was 22 when he became king, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri. So here we're told the name of the wife of Jehoram, Athaliah the granddaughter of Amri and daughter of Ahab. Nothing is said about her being the daughter of Jezebel, but she might as well have been because she certainly followed Jezebel's example. In verse 3, he also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother advised him to do wickedly, as she had advised her husband in doing wickedly. In verse 4, therefore he did evil in the sight of the Lord, like the house of Ahab, for they were his counselors after the death of his father to his destruction. He also followed their advice and went with Jehoram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, to war against Hatzael, king of Syria at Ramoth Gilead, and the Syrians wounded Jehoram. As with Jehoshaphat, he agreed to fight alongside the king of Israel. In verse 6, then he returned to Jezreel to recover from the wounds which he had received at Ramah when he fought against Hatzel, king of Syria. And Azariah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Jehoram, the son of Ahab, in Jezreel because he was sick. Now, you may have noticed that if these kings aren't confusing enough, we have two kings with the same name. This Jehoram, son of Ahab, would have been Azariah's uncle, and Azariah, uh, his father, had the same name, Jehoram. It's very confusing, but it isn't necessary to try to sort this out. <laughs> the unfortunate marriage Jehoshaphat had arranged between Ahab's daughter and Jehoshaphat's son had an adverse effect on the character of Jehoshaphat's descendants. But there was an additional factor. God had decreed that all of Ahab's descendants were to be cut off. And those descendants had spread into David's line in the house of Judah through Jehoshaphat's marriage alliance. So in verse 7, his, Azariah's, going to Joram was God's occasion for Ahaziah's downfall. For when he arrived, he went out with Jehoram against Jehu, the son of Nimshi, whom the Lord had anointed to cut off the house of Ahab. Details of that are in 2 Kings 9, if you wish to read it later. In verse 8, it happened when Jehu was executing judgment on the house of Ahab and found the princes of Judah and the sons of Ahaziah's brothers who served Ahaziah. Ahaziah had killed his brothers, but his nephews were still around, perhaps cowering and serving him, that he killed them. Then he searched for Ahaziah, and they caught him. He was hiding in Samaria. And brought him to Jehu. When they had killed him, they buried him because they said he is the son of Jehoshaphat who sought the Lord with all his heart. So the house of Ahaziah had no one to assume power over the kingdom. Now that last statement isn't entirely true as we'll read. In verse 10, when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed 
all the royal heirs of the house of Judah. So the few descendants of Ahab left after Jehu's purge were destroyed by Athaliah herself, with the exception of one baby boy that God spared to carry out his promise to maintain David's line. Verse 11, but Jehoshabeth, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered, and put him and his nurse in the bedroom. So Jehoshabeth, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, making Joash her nephew, hid him from Athaliah so that she did not kill him. And he was hidden with them in the house of God for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. Chapter 23, verse 1, In the seventh year, Jehoiada strengthened himself and made a covenant with the captains of hundreds. Verse 3, Then all the assembly made a covenant with the king in the house of God, and he said to them, Behold, the king's son shall reign as the Lord has said of the sons of David. In verse 11, And they brought out the king's son, put the crown on him, gave him the testimony, and made him king. Then Jehoiada and his sons anointed him and said, Long live the king. And then in verse 12, When Athaliah heard the voice of the people running and praising the king, she came to the people in the temple of the Lord. When she looked, there was the king, a seven-year-old boy, standing by his pillar at the entrance, and the leaders and the trumpeters were by the king. All the people of the land were rejoicing, blowing trumpets, also the singers of the musical instruments and those who led in praise. So Athaliah tore her clothes and said, treason, treason. Verse 14, and Jehoiada the priest brought out the captains of hundreds who were set over the army and said to them, take her outside under guard and slay her with the sword and slay with the sword whoever follows her. For the priest had said, do not kill her in the house of the Lord. So they seized her. She went by way of the entrance of the horse gate into the king's house and they killed her there. Jehoiada honored the sacredness of the temple and insisted that she be killed elsewhere. Verse 16, then Jehoiada made a covenant between himself, the people, and the king, and they, that they should be the Lord's people. And all the people went to the temple of Baal and tore it down. They broke in pieces its altars and images, killed Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. So this was happening in Judah while Jehu was doing something very similar in the northern kingdom, as you can read about in 2 Kings 10. Then in verse 20, he, Jehoiada, took the captains of hundreds, the nobles, the governors, the people, and all the people of the land, brought the king down from the house of the Lord. And they went through the upper gate to the king's house, set the king on the throne of the kingdom. So all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet where they had slain Athaliah with the sword. Chapter 24. Joash was seven years old when he became king. He reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. It was a nice long reign. His mother's name was Zibiah of Beersheba. Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. Jehoiada took two wives for him. He had sons and daughters. Now it happened after this that Joash set his heart on repairing the house of the Lord. Then he gathered the priests and the Levites and said to them, Go out to the cities of Judah and gather from all, their, all Israel money to repair the house of your God from year to year and see that you do it quickly. However, the Levites did not do it quickly. So the king, being a little upset with this, called Jehoiada, the chief priest. And we read in 2 Kings 12, 6 that Jehoiada was, or uh, rather Jehoram, or Joash, was 23 when he summoned Jehoiada. 
and said to him, why have you not required the Levites to bring in from Judah and from Jerusalem the collection according to the commandment of Moses, the servant of the Lord, and of the assembly of Israel for the tabernacle of witness? The sons of Athaliah, that wicked woman, had broken into the house of God and had also presented all the dedicated things to the house of the Lord, of the house of the Lord, to the Baals. Verse 13, so the workmen labored. The labor work was completed by them. They restored the house of God to its original condition, reinforced it. When they had finished, they brought the rest of the money before the king and Jehoiada. They made from it articles of the house of the Lord articles for serving and offering, spoons and vessels of gold and silver, and they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord continually all the days of Jehoiada. But Jehoiada grew old and was full of days, and he died. He was 130 years old when he died. That was older than Moses. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings, because he had done good in both Israel, in Israel, both toward God and his house. He had essentially been the king during Joash's youth. Verse 17, after the death of Jehoiada, the leaders of Judah came and bowed down to the king, and the king listened to them. Therefore, they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served wooden images and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem because of their trespass. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord. And they testified against them, but they would not listen. God gave him many chances to straighten out. Verse 20, then the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada the priest, who had stood above the people, who stood above the people and said to them, Thus says God, Why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, he also has forsaken you. This didn't please the king or the people. So they conspired against him. And at the command of the king, they stoned him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord. Now we're going to come back to this, but I'd like to turn over right now to Luke 11. Because in Luke 11, Jesus Christ makes mention of this incident. He's busy chastising the Pharisees, and he says, Woe to you, 11 verse 47. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute. That the blood of the, all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished, between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. The scriptures in the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, are ordered differently than most of our Bibles. And they end with the book of Second Chronicles. Jesus was giving the Old Testament equivalent of from Genesis to Revelation in describing the king the killing of the righteous prophets from Abel to Zechariah. And it is generally recognized that this is the Zechariah Jesus is referring to. Joash killed both a priest and a prophet. And unlike Jehoiada, who had Athaliah removed from the temple, he did so right in front of the temple, next to the altar of burnt offering. But perhaps the most gut-wrenching of all is this verse in 2 Chronicles 24, we're going back there now, in verse 22. Second Chronicles 24, 22, thus Joash the king did not remember the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but killed his son 
And as he died, he said, the Lord look on it and repay. So it happened in verse 23, in the spring of the year that the army of Syria came up against him. They came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the leaders of the people from among the people and sent all their spoil to the king of Damascus. For the army of the Syrians came with a small company of men, but the Lord delivered a very great army into their hand because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. So they executed judgment against Joash, and when they had withdrawn from him, for they left him severely wounded, his own servants conspired against him because of the blood of the sons of Jehoiada the priest. And I wonder if it's plural, whether that really means he killed more than just Zechariah, and killed him on his bed. So he died, and they buried him in the city of David, but they did not bury him in the tombs of the kings where they had buried Jehoiada. The story of Joash is one of the saddest stories in scripture. We see the negative effect that Jezebel and Athaliah had on their husbands and sons. We can see in contrast the positive effect Jehoiada had on the child king Joash. But Joash's character didn't go deep enough to last beyond his father's, his mentor's life. And he was negatively influenced by others around him when jo just Jehoiada was gone. We are told in several places in scripture how we start isn't as important as how we end up. And it is he that endures to the end that will be saved. For a final scripture, let's turn to Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18. And verse 21. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed should be remembered against him. Because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? In verse 24, when a righteous man turns away from his righteous, righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed, because of them he shall die. Our story has pointed out several lessons we can learn from, both good and bad. Be careful about how enthusiastically you support those who are wicked or becoming unequally yoked together with them. Think about what effect you are having on others and what effect others are having on you and what effect the wicked can have on society. Joash and his fathers had a bad influence on the nation, but also remember it isn't others' character that determines our destiny. We are responsible for our own behavior and we need to follow God till the end.